mixes in with the whole mix, and you mix it with some other sound sources. Make sure you can hear everything. This is going to be really fast, by the way, so there's open, lots of time for open discussion. Anthony Marco coined a phrase uh, in a conference he spoke at years ago. He called it shiver moments, and it was when something happened, you heard something, and it, you, know, you got spine tingles or whatever it was for you. Uh, he played a, a piece of audio, basically, and he uh, asked people in the room, as you're listening to this audio, just raise your arm, arm when you have a, a shiver moment, when something resonates with you. It doesn't have to be the kind of thing that makes the hair stand up on the back of your neck. It could be a moment in the podcast where you, the audience makes a connection with you, or maybe you make a connection with what you've just said. Uh, speaking from my own experience, uh, there's been a few times I've podcasted and just as I'm working through something or going on a rant, a certain phrase will tumble out of my mouth that just kind of jumped in my head. And that'll be like a moment of, oh yeah, that's what this is all about. And you kind of feel like you're 20 minutes into an episode and that should be your opening statement. Or you're not going to blow the moment and you, you just carry on with the moment rather than <coughs> killing the podcast and going back to the beginning. But having those shiver moments, whether it's identifying something new or feeling something uh, because of the content. Maybe you feel sad, maybe you feel happy. I know that when our friend Bob died, there's a whole bunch of people, myself included, who put out podcasts and we were bawling our eyes out. Uh, and everybody listened to it, not because they wanted to hear somebody cry, but because we were all feeling the same thing. Uh, and sometimes that's what the shiver moment is. It's, it's being able to relate to per another person on that feeling uh, that you share. And the final one really is team. And team could be, uh, in my case, what I've discovered is some of my most rewarding podcasting experiences were when I did a podcast with my wife, I did a podcast with Bob, um, I, you know, I've done other projects. It always seems that when I do it with somebody else, it's really rewarding. There's more to team, and I'll get to that in a second. But what's really good about having a podcasting team two people, is if you feel really lousy one day, you don't feel like podcasting, you have somebody go, no, no, come on, let's do it, we'll, we'll be fine, we'll get through this, and you're like, okay, bye, bye. And you're maybe five minutes in, you finally feel like, yeah, this was the right thing to do. But just getting, it's kind of like having a workout buddy. You, know, you have to wake up five in the morning to go to the gym, you don't really want to go to the gym, but the person's outside your house, and they, there's a rule that at 10 after five, they're gonna start honking the horn, right? And so you don't want that to happen, because you want to wake up your, your family. So. A, having a team that puts out the podcast. Your team could also include your audience. So who's listening to your show? Uh, how are they involved in the show? How do you connect with them um, in, in the listening experience? And how do they connect in you, with you in the listening experience? It doesn't mean you're always going to get content. It doesn't, or uh, by content, I mean comments back from people. It doesn't always mean that you're going to see uh, a large number of downloads. Just focus on what you have. But having that connection with people is always a handy thing. And I think that's the QR and ST. I thought I had another slide that I was going to throw in, but I didn't. But that's, that's the crux of it. My experience is the podcasts that I like the most, the ones that I subscribe to, and it could be Dixon Janes, it could be the MPP podcast, which is about photography, and I am anything but a photographer. But the, the passion that comes out is something that I can relate to, and I'm getting something out of the content. I'm learning something, I'm feeling something. It could be, uh, you know, you're gonna laugh at me, but it could be Power and Politics on CBC. You know, that's, it's a TV show, but I'm, I'm politically minded, I'm interested in what's going on. It also affects the field I work in and some of my clients, so staying on top of that. You know, there, there's a quest in each episode of a, of a political magazine show, and the quest is to inform the public and to get to the bottom of the issue. You know, we probably don't think of it that way, we just think of, oh, it's just a magazine show, they're just pumping up the news of the day. But that's their quest. Um, and uh, when you talk about shiver moments, they, they throw panels in there with opposing points of view because it makes good television. Why? Because it's going to get somebody smiling or it's going to get somebody gritting their teeth. Right? There's nothing in between. Kiss, uh, Gene Simmons from Kiss used to say, you either love Kiss or you hate Kiss. There's nothing in between. So that's their shiver moment. Uh, it's a team because they put out the show as a unit. And I'm uh, missing what was respect. Oh yeah, making sure that they that they get multiple points of view. Now, multiple points of view on a political show is in part respect to the multiple points of view, but the other respect it's getting going for the shiver moments. So that's the kind of the corporate view of it. And then, as I already noted earlier, um, 
with uh, with Ken is his modus operandi, or, or Mike Musial here, who's the virtual youper. His modus operandi is just telling people what's going on in his life, staying in con in, in touch with friends. You know, his his show isn't necessarily meant for mass consumption, uh, and I don't know how large your audience is, but. Um, but his show is very much geared towards, there's several people in this room, there's others that we know, is making sure that they know what's going on with his wife and his family and some of the projects he's working on. You know, it was just kind of self-indulgent thing that started among a group of us of making sure that we could all stay in touch with each other without having to use Facebook and use Facebook norms. Um, and to hear the passion, the, the enthusiasm in the voice, to create the shiver moments, to create the connection, to stay connected, um, and, and out of respect to their friendship. You know, we can't always see each other. This is our way of staying in touch. So those are kind of some extreme examples. And uh, that's, this. like I said, this is meant to be a short talk. But I'm open to questions, comments, suggestions, thoughts. Did I miss something? I intentionally left out the obvious. You are the important part of your podcast. Uh, but yeah, if you have all four of these elements, you got the happy corner. John. You're talking about respecting your audience uh, as, a, as a listener, as, as well as a producer of podcast. Can you recall any time where you really felt disrespected with well, the podcast? And how did you react? Well, I mean, some of it is, is obvious stuff, like the quality of the audio that's produced. Um, the, the big mistakes that or the big things that really get up in my craw are the things that, so I'll start off with the, the most intense ones and I'll work back a bit. One of them is that if you have an interview guest on your show, the guest is the star of your show, not you. I can't tell you how many podcasts I've stopped listening to because the, uh, and this is often the case in podcasts where somebody's trying to show some sort of professional status and knowledge. Uh, so they'll have an expert on to talk to them. But really what they want to do is they want to get that person talking about the stuff that interests them so they can say, yes, and I deliver this service. And I'll, let me tell you how I do it. You know, I'll tell you about a client example. And really they're making the show about them. So that bothers me. I'm not listening to the show for them, although I'm happy that they're producing the show and I'm interested in what they have to say. But in my view, they have an opportunity before the interview and after the interview to tell me what they want me to hear. And the rest of it should be their guest. So that's one. The other one that really bugs me is when people will they'll say, oh, I've got this really great guest on the show today. You know, they, they've done this, they've done this, and they've done that, and, uh, and, and we're going to talk about blah, blah, blah. All right, now I'm going to play the interview. And so they hit play on the interview. Hi, I have a really great guest on the show today. Sitting with me is <laughs> yeah. so-and-so, and they've done this, that, and the other thing. It's like, wait a second. I just listened to that two-minute spiel already, and now you're going to play it for me again. So when I think about respect of time and respect of audience and respect of guests is, Introduce once, do it nice and concisely, um, value the time, and uh, if you're going to have somebody in your show, let them be the star of your show. Uh, then you know, there's other things like checking your audio afterwards, making sure that the levels are fine. If you have a guest on the show and you're really comfortable the, with the mic, so it's right in your mouth and we can hear you nice and clearly, but your guest is not, guest is not so familiar with the mic, or you didn't place it properly and check your levels, and they can't be hear, heard as audibly, is making sure those things are balanced out so that you know a lot of people will listen to podcasts when they're at the gym when they're walking to work next to a busy you know uh, road uh, maybe they're sitting on a bus where there's bus noise and people talking um, I need to be able to hear it so if I can't hear it uh, if the mix is too low and you know even at full volume I'm pressing my earbuds into my ears so I can hear what's going on that's a problem so I know I, I get really well, there's the other one that, that uh, what was it that I used to complain about? It was, yeah, yeah, I got made fun of for a while. Because I said, don't tell me that you've got a great show today. Because first of all, if you don't have a great show, if I disagree with you, you just told me what a great show is to you, and I know that I don't have to listen to that anymore. And the other thing is, if this is a great show and you don't introduce the next one as a great show, am I supposed to go, okay, I'm not going to bother listening to this one because the great show was last time. Um, so, like little things like that. But that's just me being snot. <laughs> Anybody else? Like you know, you mentioned shiver moments, but like, so I mean, that sounds good. But you don't want to like force them. So how do you make them happen? Like the spontaneous. You don't want to be like sappy or like like in a movie where you hear like melodramatic music. Here's my shiver moment. Like how do you 
what's this, what's the way to make it happen? Well, and I don't know that you necessarily want to manufacture a shiver moment. I think you just want to let them happen. Uh, a shiver moment in music could be a chord change or a change in dynamics, uh, or you know, a, a swell of strings at the right moment, right? So you know, in, in some cases, those are manufactured, absolutely. Uh, but when you're in a podcast, I think if, if you're just telling your story or you're interviewing somebody and they, they condense a complex idea into something really short, Sometimes that could be a shiver moment. A shiver moment doesn't necessarily have to be something that's emotional, like somebody crying because a friend of theirs died. A shiver moment could be uh, and I, a tip on how to make a paper clip, open up a car door. I don't know. You know, and that, and that could be exciting for people. Uh, basically, the shiver moment is a moment of connection where the person goes, you know, I feel something. I feel happy. I feel sad. I feel angry. The shiver moment doesn't just have to be the excited feeling. It has to be some, some sort of emotional charge of some sort. Uh, can you create them? Oh, absolutely. And people have made a living creating them. You know, if you think of people like Enya, you know, her, all of her music is really designed around creating shiver moments around, and some people might not like Enya, I get that, but um, I'm not a big fan of hers. I, I own her music. And there are certain points in her music where, you know, where she sings in a, almost a pseudo falsetto voice and she's got the swells and there's just little chord changes like you feel something. But you know, I've listened to Scarborough do get angry and swear and uh, you know you can just feel the tension building and you know there's an F-bomb coming and that F-bomb hits you like woo release you know it's like that's a shiver moment. It doesn't mean you have to swear by the way. <laughs> I, I, I'm not even a... Uh, Discovered you just have a name for when those happened. I'm not even going to say what it was. Uh, yes. do, you, do you have any tips on how to keep an audience engaged for a podcast specifically? Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say no. And the reason why I'm going to say no is because I think, I used to think it had to, a lot to do with you know, content. If everybody talks about content, I often talk about context. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll get to where I'm going in a second. The reason why I talk about context is every one of us in this room could be handed the same one-page script for an audition. We're not being measured against the content. Everybody has the same content. We're going to be measured against delivery, context. What do you make the person feel when, when the script is being read? So it's not so much around the, the content that's, that's going to be decide. I'm sorry, I've, I've lost your question. What was it about uh, making a content, uh, sorry? More about audience engagement. Audience engagement, yes. So context is, is the important part. But I think people will talk about authenticity and passion. I think, it's, I think it's the passion, the enthusiasm. I'm not a photographer. I don't care about photographic history. Uh, I listen to MPP out of support for my friend, <coughs> John Meadows at the back of the room, and I was hooked, you know? Uh, the, the way he talks about a camera and how he used it and how he composed a photo and how he's going to use this um, developing uh, style that you know for the first time ever I'm like well that's cool I can relate to that not because I'm a photographer I'm an audio geek so you know would I ever go and get myself an old reel to reel tape machine like I used to use years ago and a little uh, you know razor blade and, and some tape and, and go back to doing things the old way maybe one day I'll do it but when he's talking bless you when he's talking, when John's talking about photography, I feel for audio what he feels for photography. And I think that that's, that's what really gets people excited. And I think if you can produce a show on anything, any topic that interests you, I used to do a show called Electric Sky. The entire purpose of that show was, what do I want to learn today? My audience was me. If other people wanted to listen to, great. Um, and so I would like, who do I want to interview today? Oh, you know what? Ian Boyd runs a record store down the street from where I live. I want to hear what he thinks about, you know, as an independent music store owner, what does he think about the digital music rev revolution? And so, uh, I pick people who are passionate about a topic. And, you know, I was all over the place. You know, I interviewed a, a blind guy who watched a space shuttle launch. He was invited to, to a space shuttle launch. I uh, spoke to Ian Boyd. I spoke to my cousin who, when he was 17, came out. You know, I was, there, there was no consistency across the podcast except for my own curiosity and desire to hear a story uh, and I had listeners you know and I, I think that if you if you're interested in something and you speak to people who are interested in something 
you're going to A, connect with your audience, and B, those shiver moments will naturally happen. Is it okay that, that the length of the podcast it varies? Let's say you interview one person who's, who's blind, and that, that interview is only seven minutes, and then you interview someone else who saw something else, and that interview can, that turns out to be 45 minutes. Does it, does it matter, the, the length of that? So the answer I usually give is a, a podcast should be, or any audio program, should be as long as it needs to be and nothing more. Um, and so a 45-minute podcast can be amazingly engaging, but it can also be tedious. Same can be said of a five-minute podcast. Um, in the case of Electric Sky, it was, an, it was a challenge project for myself. So I said, I'm in and out in 10 minutes. So I've done, I did interviews for that show that were anywhere between 10 minutes and an hour long, but the final cut was 10 minutes. Um, and so, uh, and part of that was to stay, I, I wanted the end product to be focused. Part of it was, it was the early days of podcasting and we were all like really concerned about competing with other people for audience attention. And I thought, well, if people know it's 10 minutes, week to week to week, and I'm, I'm consistent on the day I publish and the length of the show, then they're going to go, you know what, that's only a 10 minute show, I can give that, I can take a chance on that if I only have an hour to listen to something. So um, so there are a few kind of very, you know, was it self-serving decisions I made um, and creative decisions I made. But uh, if you've got something that's really engaging, worth listening to, I think if it's an hour and a half long, people will listen to it. But if, if you find it hard to listen to yourself, then I, I would start looking at chopping it down. So your thought process is, it has evolved? you no longer yeah. just the 10 minutes? I mean, if well, the ten, that, that was a particular show. There okay. were other shows that I've done, you know, that range anywhere between five minutes. And actually when, when I did the, uh, well, here's an example. When I did, after Bob died, I did a tribute show to him. I invited everybody from the community to submit comments on, I think it was an hour and 45 minute podcast. That's the longest thing I've ever produced. Uh, I've done shows that were an hour, an hour and a bit before. Um, and uh, I always made sure that if I, if I would prove, it's weird to say you listen to your stuff. I don't often listen to my stuff, especially after you get into a rhythm. But when it comes down to it, if I have a long show, I will listen to it beginning to end just to make sure, is there any gap in there that should be tightened up? Is it longer than it needs to be? Is there, um, you know, is there something I said that could be, that's five minutes long, could be 10 seconds long? So these are things I look at. But, um, yeah, I, I, I would think that you know, respect your audience's time, and if your audience, the message is delivered in an hour and 45 minutes, then it's an hour and 45. Uh, midway through, you were talking about some of your pet peeves with the technical elements, like the multiple introduction and the levels. Are there other things on the other extreme, like the technical elements that you think really set great podcasts apart from good ones? Um, yes. Um, you know, aside from the stuff I've already said, like passion and, and good context and all that stuff, there's a few podcasts, and, and these are the ones that tend to be a little bit more, that people put a lot of production time into it. And it's not just a podcast, it's like an audio experience at that point. And some of them sadly aren't producing anymore, and I haven't sought out replacements. Uh, but the Hollywood podcast always knocked my socks off. I, I can't think of an episode of that show that I didn't enjoy. And they might still be online, and if they are, I encourage you to listen to them. There's an actor, a friend of ours, uh, who lives in Los Angeles, who was a bit of a struggling actor, I, I guess. It's probably a safe statement to make. Um, and he definitely had some interview shows, but a lot of his stuff was just storytelling about his own life experiences. And being a Hollywood guy, uh, he knew how to tell a story in three acts. And he mixed, you know, he had, you could tell the, the act, definition because he had swells of music that came in that delineated the, the three acts and yeah they're mind-blowing uh, Bruce Murray the Zed caster another he, he used to do audio uh, well it wasn't so much audio skits I guess there was a certain amount of that but he would he would really audio produce his his stuff so he'd tell a story and he'd fly in sound and um, and you know if, if he was going to tell a story sometimes he invented characters to set up what the story was going to be about and then which into the story. Uh, what other podcasts? Uh, on the uh, on the commercial side, twenty thousand hertz is really interesting. Uh, people probably also know about ninety nine percent invisible. I listen to Radio Lab. I like their stuff. I, they, they tell good stories. Their audio production is always foreground, though. 
it, 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 so, so there's another pet peeve. There's a, there's a great way to use sound. If you're looking at incorporating sound in your podcast, I'm actually starting to look into doing that. I haven't really done much of it myself. I have a project I, I want to start, and I've actually, Paolo Pietro Paolo, who does audio documentary stuff for CBC, did um, a series with Joey Taylor and Chris Brooks, Brooks called The Wire, which is the impact of electricity on music. And it's a brilliant production. And so I, I'm taking some lessons from him on how to do audio production using sound as, as a character. And uh, what I've learned is sound needs to be really mixed into the experience. It's a character because it makes itself a character, not because it forces itself to be a character. And uh, Radio Lab, uh, while they produce great stories, they listen to their, their podcast, they fill every little space with sound. You know, they, they'll, they'll put a boing here or a little, you know, they, and they, they oversell it. And they also, they take away the opportunity for me to think in advance what's about to happen. They set it up. Um, there's a, one of the episodes I listened to recently, they were setting up a situation <laughs> where there was tension. And so they bring in the tense music, the music stops, and then they, they, they fly in a sound effect of somebody going, overload, and then they continue the story. It's like, I know I'm overloaded, you don't have to tell me. <laughs> so, stuff like that where you take away the opportunity for the person to feel it, and you just serve it to them. I know, you asked me at the positive, I ended up at the negative. Yeah, sorry, negative cells. Um, Go ahead. You know, your quest idea really resonates with me. I had a podcast that I, I did about 30, 35 episodes, and I realized I was done with my quest. And now that I look back, I had a specific quest, I was done. And at that then you'll have to feel bad about it, right? Yeah. yeah. But how do you not lose your, but you want to maybe keep your audience, maybe do something, you don't want to lose your audience completely, you don't want to stop, so is there something you could do, start a new quest or something? Like yeah, I, I think absolutely start a new quest, and, and some people, they start the new quest on a different feed and a different website, and some can say, you know, uh, for my next act, we're going to depart from talking about the Ice Age, and we're going to talk about garbage cans. You know, so, uh, if you want to stick with me, know that, you know, for the foreseeable future, I'm going to be pursuing the fine art of rubber made uh, production process. Uh, hope you stick with me. You know, and if people at that point might say, eh, rubber made doesn't appeal to me. But yeah, I, um, and you might even take a break um, in that period. Uh, and sometimes you can, in fact, when Scarborough dude took a, a break, he even said, you know, I'm gonna get to episode, was episode 500, I think it was. I get to episode 500 and I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop this podcast or I'm gonna take a break. I can't remember what you said. So, uh, you know, know that there's going to be some silence for a while. Uh, I, I don't think there's any harm in saying, you know, I'm, I'm going to, I've reached the end of this thought process and I want to figure out what's next. So stick around and I'll let you know when I come up or something. <coughs> yeah. John? I actually just want to underscore on your side because you were saying all these nice things about MPP, <laughs> which hasn't been out in a while because I'm about to reboot it. Yeah. And it's been a while. I, I think it's better to reboot something than to sound bored. Because yeah. I guarantee you, like, if, if the host of the show is bored, your audience would be bored and gone so quickly. But if you do a reboot, uh, if you can still bring passion and enthusiasm to the new topic, you, know, you, you probably you'll hold on to more listeners than doing the same old, same old. Yeah, I agree. Did, was there a hand up on the side of the room? I have a question. Oh. Do you need tips for solo podcasts? Sorry, doing it's like solo, like just one person yeah. doing the episode. Um, do you have any tips for that? Oh, do I have any tips? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, and I produce a solo podcast. This is the one I actually I produce a couple of solo podcasts. One of them is this kind of introspective, looking at myself, sharing just my daily life stuff. Uh, and in that, that only became possible actually. My, my our, our friend Bob. Uh, was the one who kind of convinced me because there was this group of people. I think Mike was part of it, and uh, I, I don't know, Bill, if you were part of it. When they started calling it nano casting, which was basically just turn on a recorder, say what you want to say for five, ten minutes. Doesn't have to be long. You put it out, and uh, I was introduced by boss to boss jock, definitely by Bill or Sylvain, and it made it really easy. And it was I've spent so much time producing podcasts where I meticulously labored over. The intro and, and you know the sound and making sure the production was right and trimming up interviews so they still sounded like a conversation so that people could tell where the cuts were 
uh, things like that. So I went from that meticulous overproduction to doing a podcast on my own where I made it as simple as possible. Record, stop, publish kind of thing. And I think, depending on what your quest is, um, the easier you make it for yourself, the more likely you are to do it. And while there are long gaps in, in what I do, it's not from, from a lack of ease in the process. It's more of, I don't have the time to do it, or I don't feel inspired to do it today, and I can forgive myself in those days. Um, but the simple, the, the, if, you know, I use Boss Jock, which, stay tuned, listen to Mike use you all, he, he, he might be reworking Boss Jock, which is a great app, which has now gone neglected for too long, and some features no longer work as a result. Um, it still mostly works. Um, and so I'll continue to use it until it finally dies on me. Um, and that's, that's one of the cases where I either have my earbuds on or I put it in the cradle in my car and I hit record and I carry on for a few minutes and I stop. I recorded an episode yesterday. Uh, I took the train in from Ottawa yesterday. And I, I knew kind of what I wanted to talk about and so I talked about this whole experience. And it wasn't until around the seven or eight minute mark in what is a 12 minute episode that it clicked. And that's, so that's why I was saying earlier, you don't want to kill your recording and go back to the beginning. I just kept going with it and I realized, okay, yeah, that's what I'm talking about here. And then the final four minutes are me you know, riffing on that idea. So it was a seven minute setup for a four minute podcast, basically. So if people suffer through it, then great. But the idea is, I, I, if I had to re-record it, we can't try to recapture it, I wouldn't have done it. I just pain free, record, stop, publish, kind of. That's about my best tip. There might be other tips, uh, but have fun. You know, I think the big thing is if you don't have a quest, you don't have a podcast. And it's funny because for years, and people in this room will attest to this. I'll get you a second, Brent. For years, I told people, oh, you know, you're into be, being a librarian. Oh, you should podcast about being a librarian. Or you know, you should do a podcast. I wouldn't even say that. I would just say you should do a podcast. I, would, I was, I was like the number one champion for podcasting. I was like, trying to get everybody to podcast. And I realized the folly of that now. It's only after I reviewed that, uh, that podcast, that, or the recording of that uh, conference session from 2013, that I realized, no, no, you shouldn't do a podcast unless you have a quest. Because then, it, it's, then you, you have no motivation to do it. Uh, I had a suggestion about doing solo podcasting. You can still uh, have a team. Uh, if you're doing it by yourself, by going to like events like this and meetups and stuff, you can find like-minded producers to uh, motivate you to keep doing your show or to ask questions or to talk to when you're having you know, issues or maybe you're not feeling your request anymore. Uh, I, I, I currently don't have any solo produced shows, but back when I did, I found that that was really helpful to uh, keep me motivated to keep doing my show was to just have uh, podcasting friends uh, to, to, to fall back on if I was starting to lose motivation. How many, peer, how many people here have a solo podcast? All right, so I'm going to pick on a few people. One tip from you, John. Um, well, like I said before, don't be afraid to do a reboot or something if you find yourself in a rut. And take a break if you have to so that most important thing to have is the enthusiasm. And if you're and if you're the solo person in the show, you have to deliver all that enthusiasm. You know, because you can't rip against another host or something. Uh, so it's become doubly important that you're at. Ken. Don't over plan, don't aim for perfection, don't do it unless you're really enjoying it and uh, just go with it. Let it flow. Mike to emphasize the passion. I, I do this podcast because of the area I live in, because I love the town and the people I'm with so much. And it was originally a small podcast for friends, but I think it picked up because people related to the area, related to the experiences. And if you're really passionate about what you've got to say, people are going to find it interesting. Not everybody. Not everybody's interested in small towns and the northern shores of, of Lake Superior. But those that are interested have been following for years. I probably need to beat up for this, but I'm going to pick on Bill also. And I'm going to pick on you because you did a podcast for a long time and you don't do it anymore. So, do you have any advice? Most of it's out of date now. <laughs> <laughs> I stopped doing it until the iPhones came out. I don't know. Having run a lot of like podcast meetups and stuff back 
fun and I mean I can yeah the, like don't over plan don't overthink it just do it like um, that's I can still remember guys coming out to some of the first few geek dinners that we did they were like yeah you know I've recorded a couple episodes of it but I'm a bit of a like audio file and I just can't get the sound right never did hear anything from them like, yeah. and remember you, if you, you can't let perfection yeah. take over everything just gotta do it. And, <clears throat> I mean, who, who's released a podcast and is embarrassed in the first episode? I mean, like, <laughs> everybody, like, you don't have to go back and listen to the first episode, so, like, don't worry about it. You don't have to listen to it. <laughs> Rick, did you do a solo podcast? Not a solo. Okay. Saying I'm embarrassed by first episode. Oh, okay. Um, and I, uh, I mean, th that one podcast I do is not my only solo podcast. I do something, a couple of other things. Um, the main one is I do some stuff about public affairs, and often what I do is I interview politicians, and then I, I top and tail it and talk about why it's, you know, to my point earlier, talk about what's important to you and why it should matter to the audience before and after, and I let my politician be the, the main voice. You know, you can hear me ask the questions, but I let the, the guest speak. But that's, that's kind of a solo in the half project, if you consider I have guests. Anybody else? Well, you mentioned sometimes you're not motivated to get into recording thing. So you, like one of your buddies says, hey, let's go to the microphone. Well, if you're a solo podcaster, who do you motivate to get into the microphone? No. And, and, and I guess that's the one advantage of being a solo podcaster is if you're not feeling it, you can just say, you know what, not today. Uh -huh. And it's harder if, you know, in the stuff I've done in a team, like the stuff I did with my wife, the stuff I did with Bob, we pick days of the week that we are publishing. And if you didn't publish, your audience noticed. In, in both those cases, we actually had large followings in our show. And so, if it ever felt like work, it showed. And there were a few times, you know, you're kind of fatigued, you know, maybe the kids were giving you grief. And because my wife and I, you know, because they're our kids, if, you know, you're fighting with your kids and you get to 10 o'clock at night, and you're like, now we have to record a podcast. Like, this is not going to sound good, but our, we have to publish at 6 a.m. tomorrow because that's Wednesday, and if we don't publish, we get a whole lot, a lot of, you know, actually this was a case where we got people emailing us, is everything okay? We didn't get a podcast today. You know, and so uh, I, I think that's the one advantage of being a, uh, podcasting on your own is on the days you don't feel it, and there will be many for me just because I have other stuff going on, I can just say, not today. And I don't have to worry about Bob saying, come on, we can do it. All right, well, I'm here all weekend if you want to chat. Thank you very much for being part of the session.